It was Friday afternoon, 16 o'clock, or if you prefer, 4 p.m. for those unfamiliar with military time, which is what we use in law enforcement. Things are pretty quiet in any government agency at this time of day on Friday, and our office at the Mason County Sheriff's Department was no exception. The shift changed at 3 o'clock in the afternoon, and most of the employees who worked regular hours left early, taking some unused work time. My captain and chief mate, Benito Ben Villanueva, left at noon that day to go on a mini vacation with his family to the Twin Cities for the weekend. As for me, I was anxiously awaiting the return of the day shift lieutenant, Deputy Sheriff Christopher Hayes, to return from an important assignment I had given him earlier in the week. My name is Sean Patrick Quinn, Jr., but everyone calls me Pat. I am the newly elected and sworn in sheriff of Mason County. This day marks the end of my first official week in office since being sworn in Monday morning. I gave Chris Hayes an assignment right after the swearing-in ceremony and originally planned to have him complete it later that day. But I changed my mind and decided to ask him to hold off on the assignment until today. It is the responsibility of lieutenants to serve warrants, notices, and official papers to individuals when asked to do so. Citizens pay $80 for the sheriff's office to serve official papers. For me, it was money well spent. And so this afternoon, I had instructed my good lieutenant to serve divorce papers to my soon-to-be ex-wife Clarissa. So I sat in my office and anxiously awaited his arrival to see how it would go. At about 4.03 p.m., a very pissed-off Lieutenant Chris Hayes burst into my office. Next time you decide to get a divorce, Pat, hand that bitch the damn papers yourself. I take it the handing over process didn't go very well, grinned I. Look at me, Pat, Chris said, pointing to the right side of his face. His entire cheek and right ear were red. That stupid bitch punched me right in the face. What did she do? I couldn't believe what I had just heard. I didn't stutter. I handed her the damn papers and she slapped me in the face. Oh my God. I burst into laughter. That's the most fantastic thing I've ever heard. Please, for God's sake, tell me you're not kidding. Hell no, I'm not kidding, he said, taking a seat across from my desk. She came to the door, and I politely asked her if she was Clarissa Marie Quinn. She answered yes. I said, Clarissa Marie Quinn, you have been served. She totally freaked out, got into an argument with me, started bellowing at the top of her lungs, and ended it with a damn punch right on my right cheek and ear. Do you know how much it hurts like hell when you get punched in the ear, Pat? It hurts, bitch. Even if it's a woman doing it, damn it. Sorry, sorry, I said, trying to keep from laughing. I'm not laughing at the fact that you got slapped. I'm laughing at that stupid fool who lost her temper like that. And then a final thought popped into my head. Oh God, please, 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 for heaven's sake, tell me you were wearing your camera on your lapel when all this was going on. Please tell me you had the good sense to wear it when all this was going on. What, the camera on your lapel? Of course I was wearing it. How stupid are you? Oh, that's right. I get it. Now Chris understood. This summer and fall, I was essentially acting sheriff while my predecessor, William Bud Roberts, was the lame duck and absentee sheriff. So not only did I campaign to replace Bud as sheriff, but I also managed the day-to-day -day operations of the entire department. One of the best things I did was to use confiscated drug money to buy Wolfcam body-worn cameras for each sheriff's deputy. The cameras were attached to the shoulder lapels of the uniforms and provided 1080p high-definition video and crystal-clear audio that captured any events a deputy might encounter. The video was recorded via Bluetooth to an onboard DVR, which also recorded video and audio from the deputy's dashboard camera. Every department that implemented these cameras saw a significant decrease in the number of complaints filed by citizens trying to accuse us of harassment or excessive use of force. In fact, complaints were still filed, but were usually withdrawn as soon as the offenders or their families saw the video of the incident. The cameras were the size of half the palm of my hand. At first, my deputies had mixed feelings about the cameras. On the one hand, they felt like Big Brother was watching them. 
but by now, the videos have confirmed no less than six accounts by my assistants of various incidents about which there have been complaints from citizens. All six complaints were withdrawn when the parties, and their attorneys of course, were given an opportunity to review the videotape. I was absolutely thrilled as I couldn't wait to see the video. Hopefully, it would give me all the evidence and momentum I needed to carry out my plans to divorce my cheating wife and dictate a divorce on my terms. Chris pulled the video out of his cruiser and uploaded it to my laptop. The video began with Chris casually walking to the steps leading up to the porch of my farmhouse. He rang the doorbell twice before Clarissa finally appeared. When she appeared, a shocked expression was clearly visible on her face when she saw the deputy sheriff at her door. Yes? Can I help you? She asked. Are you Clarissa Marie Quinn? Asked Chris. Oh, come on. You know it's me. What's the matter? Ma'am, I'm Deputy Lieutenant Chris Hayes, he said, holding out a manila envelope to her. Mrs. Quinn, you've been officially served. What, are you kidding me? No, ma'am. You've been served with a summons. Oh my God, I can't believe it. I can't believe that brainless son of a bitch sent one of his damn deputies to do this. Good afternoon, ma'am, Chris said, turned and walked back to his cruiser. Hey, God damn it! Clarissa continued half-shoving, half-slapping Chris on the back. I'm not done with you yet. Tell that bastard he better be home for dinner. I won't accept that. Tell him to get his ass home so we can talk this over. Ma'am, you need to calm down. I will not tolerate you touching me in an aggressive manner. Chris struggled to remain calm. Or what? What the hell are you going to do? You're just a deputy sheriff. You're nobody. Ma'am, I'm warning you. You need to step back and calm down. Oh, now you're trying to tell me what to do? You're not telling me to do a damn thing. I'm still the sheriff's wife, asshole. She headed toward him, waving the envelope as if threatening to hit him with it. Tell Patrick to be home by six o'clock. He better not go to his little whore's house on the north side. Ma'am, calm down now. Chris reached forward and put a hand on her shoulder to stop her from approaching him. Instead of calming her down, this sent Clarissa into a full nuclear explosion. Get your damn hands off me, asshole! She screamed, batting his hand away. Don't you ever touch me! And then... Whack! Clarissa punched poor Chris right in the right side of his face. And tell that asshole to get his ass home immediately! She yelled, turning and stomping back into the house. Oh my god, that was awesome! said I bursting into hysterical laughter again. But Jesus Christ, Chris, why didn't you arrest her right on the spot? To tell you the truth, Chris said, I was stunned as hell and didn't know what to do. I wasn't sure whether to drag her off in handcuffs or just let you deal with the stupid slut. So I came back here and decided to drop the ball in your lap. Oh, no, 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 absolutely not, I quipped. You're going to go back in there and arrest her dumbass for assaulting a law enforcement officer. That's what you're going to do. Are you kidding me, Pat? Are you seriously going to drag me into this shit? Dude, you're already in it up to your eyeballs. Besides, don't you want a little revenge? Don't you think it would be great if you were the one to take her to jail? Log her? Sketch her? In other words, humiliate her to death for punching you in the face? Chris thought for a moment and sighed. You certainly make attractive arguments. I don't dispute that. But I'm not going alone. If she pisses me off any more than she already has, I'll shake the shit out of her and maybe electrocute her. I can't escape the thought that if I fry the wife of a sitting sheriff, it'll be a black mark on my shining law enforcement record. Pat? You do realize it'll probably be in the paper and everything, right? Don't worry about that. I'll handle it. And she can't stay here, you know. Our jail is full. She'll have to go to Choctaw County tonight, and that's a two-hour van ride. Not our problem. She made her bed in more than one, and now she has to lie in it. So, are you sending someone with me or what? Asked Chris. Who's the lieutenant on duty right now? I asked. Angel Ryerson. Great. Have Angel and one of her aides meet with you. Have a little show of force. Won't that scare your kids, Pat? 
No. They'll spend the weekend with the youth group from St. Matt A.S. They'll go to the Twin Cities to stay in a hotel with an indoor water park and have fun at the Mall of America. They'll probably spend most of the weekend at the pool or at Camp Snoopy. First, I thought they called it Nickelodeon something like that now, Chris said, picking up his hat. Yeah, I guess you're right. But everyone I know still calls the place Camp Snoopy. Okay, Pat. I think it's time to go arrest your stupid wife. Good luck. Call me when you're done. Next chapter. Needless to say, Clarissa's arrest didn't go well, at least not for Clarissa. She caused such a scandal that she nearly received an additional charge of resisting arrest. The videotape shows Lieutenant Angel Ryerson, a dynamo only five, three inches tall, literally plowing Clarissa onto our front porch while another sheriff's deputy, Brad Lowe, handcuffed her and read Clarissa her rights. All the while, Clarissa was hysterically crying and yelling at Brad, Angel, and Chris, threatening to sue them for false arrest, excessive use of force, and anything else she could think of. But it was all caught on video in all its 1080p glory, and with perfect audio that caught every swear word, sneeze, and snort. Add to that the video of her being handed her papers, and there's not a single judge who would think the three sheriff's deputies had behaved exceptionally professionally the entire time. By 6.30 p.m., Clarissa was photographed, registered, fingerprinted, and admitted to the Mason County Jail. By 7 p.m., she was dressed in red and white striped jail clothes and the same red sneakers. She cried hysterically as she was led to a van that took her nearly two hours south to the Choctaw County Jail near the town of Cherokee Flats. The Choctaw County Jail has a capacity of 240 inmates, while our jail holds no more than 40, and a full house meant that our jail was literally bursting at the seams. This was a situation that I, as sheriff, had to fix, and it was one of my top priorities. Since the magistrate judge doesn't work weekends except for emergency warrants, Clarissa would now have most of the next 72 hours to sit and think about what she had done. A brief phone call to my counterpart in Choctaw County, Sheriff Garrett Myers, secured Clarissa a separate jail cell away from other inmates who might try to harm her while she was there. Sheriff Myers has also made sure that his correctional officers keep a close eye on Clarissa and keep her closely guarded. She will be taken to the jail under an alias, so no one will know she is there or who she is. Chris Hayes sent me a picture of Clarissa on my smartphone. She was pathetic in every way imaginable. She was still a very beautiful woman in every way. But the photo was not a picture of a young, vibrant, or confident woman. It was a picture of a woman who had hit rock bottom and was now beginning to truly realize the consequences of her actions over the past two-plus years. Her eyes read the horror and fear of humanity, and her face had a look of hopelessness and destitution. In fact, her face reminded me of many of the pictures of the millions of women and men who have been imprisoned in thousands of prisons across our country throughout history. Clarissa had never worn the guise of a criminal a day in her life, but I couldn't help but notice how the registration photo instantly labeled her as a common con artist. Ironically, the photo in all its bleakness matched the image of the woman Clarissa had become since her affair with Bud Roberts began. It's funny how a simple photograph can remind us that the line between the cream of society and the scourge of society is thin indeed. I plan to spend most of the weekend with my new bride, Shannon Sullivan, and her amazing daughter, Bridget. After the incident with Clarissa's arrest, I had to stop by the station to feed the horses and take care of a few other little things. I didn't end up getting to Shannon's house until 7.30 p.m., about the same time Chris Hayes sent me Clarissa's picture. I walked into Shannon's small but cozy apartment and was greeted by the smell of home-cooked food which immediately reminded me of meals prepared by my dear grandmother. Shannon and Bridget arrived home shortly before I did, as Shannon's shift at Holy Family Medical Center's ICU didn't end until 7 p.m., after which she had to pick up Bridget from her friend's house, where she went after school on the days that Shannon had to work. Patrick! Bridget yelled, running out of the kitchen. Hi, Bridget, I said, hugging her tightly. 
How are my two favorite girls in the world doing? Great. I've been looking forward to meeting you all day, Patrick. Would you like to see my bug collection? I'd love to, honey, but why are you collecting bugs in the middle of winter? Mom and I used to catch bugs last fall, silly. Her teacher had all the baby bugs on display and finally sent them home today, Shannon explained, pulling in for a kiss. Her voice softened to a sultry tone as she smiled and asked, How are you, handsome? Much better already, I replied after a luscious kiss. Bad day at work? I'll explain after dinner. Okay, she said with a concerned look. Bridget spent the next 20 minutes telling me about her bug collection and how her day at school was going, right up until Shannon put a huge plate of meatballs and mashed potatoes on the table. I couldn't believe she could whip up such a delicious dish so quickly. It turned out that Shannon likes to make five or six full meals for the weekend and then put them in the freezer to take out and put in the oven to warm up later. I could only hope that the sheriff's office would run as efficiently as Shannon runs her household. It only confirmed that I had indeed picked a winner. After dinner, I helped Shannon and Bridget clear the table and washed most of the dishes, which was the least I could do after a great meal. We played a board game of bonkers, which Bridget just loves. Then it was time for Bridget to go to bed, so I read her a story. Today it was The Lorax by Dr. Seuss. When Bridget went to bed, I met Shannon in the living room where she had changed into pajama pants and a Minnesota State t-shirt and was sipping juice. No wine tonight? I asked. Hmm, not tonight, love. I have to work tomorrow, and I promised Mindy Sutherland I'd be there to pick her up by six. Mom's coming early to pick up the baby and take her to the ranch for the day. I see. I'm sure she'll have fun. But you won't say no to a glass. I don't mind, I said heading into the kitchen and pouring myself a large glass of Chardonnay. I'm not enough of a wine connoisseur to know what wine to drink and when to drink it, before, during, or after a meal. But Shannon's peach Chardonnay was good. It had alcohol in it, and it would suffice for my simple palate. I sat down next to Shannon on the couch and let out a long sigh, finally letting go of all the stress of this day and my first week as sheriff. It was the sigh of someone who had a rough day, I thought things were going pretty well so far. For the most part it has, I said, taking a long sip of wine. This afternoon, however, things have changed a bit. How so? I looked into Shannon's beautiful eyes and said, Chris Hayes handed Clarissa the papers this afternoon. Shannon tensed up and became very worried. Oh my goodness, this is finally happening. Are you really getting a divorce? She grabbed my left hand, and I could feel her trembling. This is really happening. We're really going to be together. Tears appeared in her eyes, one streaming down her right cheek. Yes, we will, baby, I said, squeezing her hand tightly. How did she take it? I took a deep breath and closed my eyes. It was like a train wreck. Like what? What happened? You wouldn't believe me if I told you. Sean Patrick Quinn don't do this to me. You can't start a story like that and not finish it. It's not fair, she admonished. Okay, okay. You're right. My lieutenant, Chris Hayes, who works the day shift, got the papers to hand in this afternoon. When he gave her the papers, Clarissa went absolutely ballistic, calling him names, cursing at him, basically everything you can think of. And then, I paused for effect, she punched him right in the face. Shannon gasped in shock. Oh my God, you've got to be kidding me. No, I'm not kidding. You should have seen how upset Chris was when he got back. He was just out of his mind. And what happened next? Well, if you want to know, I began. Oh, don't tease me. Tell me what happened. I sent Chris back to the house with an evening shift lieutenant named Angel Ryerson and another sheriff's deputy named Brad Lowe. I ordered them to arrest Clarissa for assaulting a law enforcement officer. Another shocked sigh. Oh my God, are you kidding me? What are you thinking? What do you mean, what am I thinking? Said I, somewhat dumbfounded. Clarissa attacked one of my assistants. She's no different from anyone else. It was a completely unprovoked attack. I know, but technically she's still your wife. I mean, 
I know she's done a lot of terrible things to you, but arresting her? This isn't payback for all the shit she and Bud and Marion Lawson did. It's a direct result of her getting pissed off to the point where she jumped on one of my deputies to get to me. Regardless of how she or I feel about everything, there is no excuse for her hitting one of my deputies. I also need to make it clear to Chris and my aides that I will not tolerate any insults from or towards them. I know, I know, Shannon said, calming down a bit. It's just all so shocking that I'm having a hard time comprehending everything that's going on. I know, baby, I know, I said, squeezing her hand tightly. So how do you think this is going to affect everything? Well, I said, pondering. The only thing I can think of is that maybe it will make Clarissa feel more relaxed about the divorce. Maybe through this turn of events, I can get her to believe in the reasonableness of a consensual divorce. A look of shock reappeared on Shannon's face. My God, Patrick, I don't mean to sound like an unsupportive bitch, but is that why you arrested her? To force her into your divorce? No, 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 I said firmly, shaking my head. Absolutely not. Put that thought out of your head right now. I would never do anything like that. It would bring me down to the level of her and Bud Roberts. Make no mistake about it. Clarissa broke the law by assaulting one of my deputies. That's why she's spending the weekend in jail. I will do everything I can to help her get out of this situation in the best way legally possible. But I'd be lying if I said I wasn't going to use this to help you, and I get off to the best possible start in our life together. And if that can be done by using her arrest to smooth the way to an amicable divorce, then so be it. I promise you that I'm not going to use this to screw over Clarissa during the divorce itself, but only to get her to come to her senses, to not resist the inevitable, and to help make things as easy as possible for the boys. You're right, Patrick. I should have known better. You're not that kind of person. I'm sorry I brought it up. Shannon leaned over and kissed me in apology. Don't be, I said. I'm counting on you to help me not lose my mind. This job has clearly gone to Bud Roberts' head, and I'm counting on you to be my anchor, baby. Well, Shannon said, grinning mischievously and setting her wine glass on the table. I'm not much of an anchor thrower, but I'd really appreciate it if you would, shall we say, moor your ship in my little port? I began to giggle uncontrollably. What did you just say, love? Damn it, Patrick. I'm trying to talk and hint a little. Hey, I like dirty talk as much as any other guy, but you're going to have to do better than that. So, Sheriff, are we going to do this or what? Oh, you better believe we are, I said as she led me by the hand into her bedroom. The next two hours went by like one solid blur. Next chapter. Shannon left for work shortly after 5.15 the next morning. She didn't even bother to shower before leaving. Of course, any normal man wouldn't have noticed the difference. Most of the time, all we need is a little deodorant and a change of clothes. And Shannon was a natural beauty for whom makeup wasn't a necessity anyway. Since I popped out of the house right after Shannon's mother, Suzanne, arrived to be with Bridget until she got out of bed. I went back to the farm to do some chores around the house and plan what I was going to do for the rest of the day. My attorney in the divorce case was a feral cat named Danielle Nichols. She was the scariest divorce attorney in town, and almost certainly Clarissa would have gone to her if I hadn't gone to Danielle first. I know this because Clarissa called Danielle shortly after I had already hired her, since Clarissa wanted to have a lawyer ready in case she couldn't talk me out of my divorce. This all happened last fall, before I had even served Clarissa with the papers. Danielle was in her office at Brown, Graham, Norris, Slater, and Nichols, even though the firm itself was closed for the weekend. I decided that, given the events of the previous afternoon, I should call Danielle in advance. As you might expect, Danielle was frothing at the mouth discussing what she could do with Clarissa as part of the divorce proceedings after she had foolishly slapped one of my assistants. Looking into the eyes of Danielle Nichols, Esquire, was like looking into the eyes of Satan himself. I could only be glad she was on my side. Danielle was beautiful in a sultry and promiscuous way, but at the same time, she gave off the vibe of a black widow spider that would likely kill and eat you as soon as the copulations were over. 
It was about 15 minutes into our consultation when my cell phone rang. It was a number I probably shouldn't have had in my phone, but which I had programmed nonetheless. The caller ID said, Caroline Bennett. Hi, Caroline, I said, answering the call. Patrick, thank God I was able to reach you. Could you tell me what's going on with Clarissa? She called me this morning and told me she was in jail in Cherokee Flats and that you were responsible for putting her there. Excuse me, I said to Danielle, covering the phone with both hands. I need to take a call. I'll be there in a few minutes. I'm really sorry. No, don't apologize, Danielle said. Feel free to stay here. I'll run down to the break room and see if we have coffee in the damn place. Once Danielle was out of the room, I continued. Well, Caroline, the truth is that Clarissa really is in jail in Cherokee Flats. There was no room for additional prisoners here in Red River Falls, so she was sent elsewhere. My God, Patrick. What could she have done that justifies your imprisonment? Caroline, at the risk of our special friendship, let me be perfectly clear. I did not cause Clarissa to be incarcerated for any malicious reason. I followed all the procedures for filing divorce papers and went to the sheriff's department. I paid the appropriate fee and all that, just like any normal citizen would have done. I did this to avoid what I thought would be an unpleasant confrontation between Clarissa and me. Instead, Clarissa started an altercation with one of my aides, during which she became aggressive, belligerent, and punched my aide in the face. No, 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 Patrick. You are mistaken. Clarissa has a temper sometimes. Maybe even a lot. But my daughter would never intentionally hit an officer of the law. I just can't believe it. Your officer must be mistaken or making a big deal out of it. I hate to tell you this, Caroline, I said, sighing. But the whole incident was caught on video. Cameras and pictures don't tell the whole story, Patrick. True, but in this case, it's very simple. All my assistants now carry little cameras on them that record everything in high definition. In this particular case, you might as well shoot with a television camera because there's not much difference. You'll understand when you see the video, Caroline. I could hear Caroline sniffling and trying to suppress a sob. Please, Patrick, if our special friendship means anything to you, please promise me you'll do everything you can to help her. Please for her sake and for the sake of my grandchildren. Caroline, I said, you can rest assured that I will do everything I can to help her. I promise you this. I'll see her here soon, and I assure you that I'll have her out on bail no later than first thing Monday morning. And I'm also assured that this weekend will be the last time she sees the inside of a jail cell. Thank you, Patrick. It means so much to me. You're welcome, Caroline. Oh. And Patrick? Yes, Caroline? She paused. Don't ever forget how much you mean to me, Patrick. I know there is a new love in your life. I can only hope and pray that she treats you the way I would treat you if you were mine, though the way you deserve. Now it was my turn to look for something to say. I appreciate that, Caroline. And don't ever forget how much you mean to me. Goodbye, Patrick. We'll talk again soon. I'll look forward to it. And she hung up. It took me a few minutes to come to my senses after talking to Caroline. There was something about her that had me hooked for the rest of my life. It felt damn good to have Shannon in my life now. To be completely honest, there aren't many women in this world that could keep me from running off to spend time with Caroline if she wanted to. I was pondering this just as Danielle returned to her office with two cups of fresh coffee and set one of them on the table in front of me. I could easily assume that Danielle was capable of both with me, or any other man for that matter. She was, as she put it, happily divorced. Danielle was married to Karsten Brown, who was Brown at Brown, Graham, Norris, Slater, and Nichols, and who himself had been happily married to another woman up until Danielle joined the firm. Danielle was an associate attorney at the firm until Karsten Brown divorced. She then became a partner in the firm shortly after becoming Karsten Brown's bedroom partner. From a gossip columnist's point of view, it was all scandalously delicious, which only confirmed the old adage. There's not much of interest in a small town, but what you hear more than makes up for it. So, Danielle said, getting comfortable in her high-backed chair, 
Let's think about how we can crucify that bitchy wife of yours. Danielle thought I was out of my mind trying to negotiate a fair divorce because she was sure she could use Clarissa's arrest to get anything I wanted from me, hanging the prospect of additional jail time for her. Truth be told, all I wanted from Clarissa was a quick and easy divorce. I just wanted to split what we had 50-50 and share custody of the boys. I wanted the boys to still live with me on the farm, and Clarissa would be free to visit them after school and every weekend, as well as keep them with me for a good portion of the summer months. And personally, I think Daniel just wanted to watch Clarissa wriggle around like the proverbial worm on a hook. As for me, I was determined to separate from her while keeping her honor intact, at least in the eyes of our sons. I hoped that would be incentive enough to knock the fighting spirit out of her. I left Danielle's office just after nine. I had to make a quick visit to another attorney. I drove to the west side of the city, to a posh neighborhood called Elk Run Heights. It was one of the newest apartment complexes in Red River Falls, filled with poppy mansions that housed people in high places in Red River Falls. Fox Run Golf and Country Club was included in the complex, and almost every home had a course in front of it. Most residents could swim in their pools and then sunbathe in one of the sand traps and completely eliminate the need to go to the beach, at least in the summertime. At 5,945 Elk Run Drive lived one Marion Lawson Esquire, also known as the Mason County Prosecutor. Needless to say, Marion wasn't expecting me today. It was the middle of January, and I wasn't about to interrupt his sit-down with the four of us. Marion, as it turned out, preferred threesome fun, especially with my wife and Bud Roberts. I walked up to the front of the stately brick house and rang the doorbell. A few moments later, Marion himself appeared. Jesus, he said when he saw me, and yet my weekend was going so well. It's good to see you too, Marion. Lawson stood like that with the door ajar. So, aren't you going to invite me in? Not unless I have a good reason, he muttered. Oh, I have business to discuss, I assure you. Does it concern me in any way, shape, or form? Marion, I said with a slight reproach in my voice, everything I do concerns you in one way or another. Marion only rolled his eyes and opened the door to let me in. My office is inside and to the left, and take your damn shoes off so you don't ruin my wood floors. We just had them cleaned, painted, and varnished. Oh, it almost sounds like we're going to be living here for a while. Don't think about it. You won't stay long enough to watch the playoffs, and every beer in the fridge says Marion, not Patrick. Whatever. The Vikes have been eliminated for a while now. Hell, Pat, the Vikes are out after the preseason, for God's sake, he grumbled. How can you watch those losers? Hey, 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 now. To hate my team is to hate me, I replied. Do you really want me to answer that, Quinn? Probably not, I agreed. We entered the house and headed toward Marion's office when his wife, Patty Jean, spotted us from the massive open kitchen. Whatever she was cooking smelled fantastic, and my rumbling stomach reminded me that I hadn't eaten yet. Oh, hello, Sheriff. What brings you in today? called out Patty from the kitchen. Before I could answer, Marion interrupted. He won't be long, and we'll be in the office. We have important business to attend to, so make sure we aren't disturbed. Patty Jean looked utterly mortified at her husband's rebuke. But she brightened up again when I said, It's good to see you again, Patty. Whatever you're cooking smells just delicious, dear. Thank you, Patrick. We'd love to have you join us for dinner sometime. And I'd love to join you sometime. I promise to bring my fiance, C, lots of bad jokes and a big appetite. Patty Jean started laughing, and Marion practically dragged me into his office, closed the door behind us, and locked it. By the way, you're not coming to dinner, he chided, settling me into a chair in front of his huge oak desk. But Patty Jean just invited me, Marion. It would be rude to refuse her. Marion threw me a disgruntled look, settling into an equally bland chair. Did you come here just to piss me off, Pat? Or did you really have something you wanted to talk to me about? Tell Patty she doesn't need to overreact. I'm a simple man with simple tastes. Damn it, Sheriff. Meatloaf, mashed potatoes and gravy. 
Comfort food is always my favorite, especially in the winter. I bet Patty can do magic with that. I guess her cooking helps you keep your girlish figure, Marion, I grinned. I'm warning you, Pat. My deputies arrested my wife last night. Lawson's jaw nearly dropped to the floor. What? Are you kidding me? No, I'm not kidding. She was served divorce papers yesterday and she attacked one of my assistants. Lawson stared at me wide-eyed. You know, Phil Robertson said it best. You're a special kind of dumbass, aren't you, Pat? I mean, my God, who the hell did the people of this county elect as sheriff? They elected someone who doesn't think they or their families are above the law. Bullshit. What did she do? Confronted him as he walked by? No. She got angry, took her anger out on my deputy sheriff and punched him right in the face. We have a videotape of it. Who? Who what? I asked, confused. Who was the sheriff's deputy who attended to her? Lieutenant Chris Hayes. Oh, Jesus, Lawson said, making a sour face and shaking his head. Figures. If that damn idiot isn't doing something right now that deserves a slap, then as the smart money says, it's only a matter of time. Probably get a slap right now from that tattooed junkie whore of his. I shifted in my chair, preparing to defend Chris and Tanya. I assure you Lieutenant Hayes is not an idiot, and neither is his new wife. In fact, she probably has the highest IQ in Mason County, and the only thing she has on her record is a simple drug charge in Massachusetts. Are you kidding me? You let your goddamn deputy marry that bitch? I know for a fact she sells a shitload of pot out of her damn store on the north side of town. Fixing and selling computers and old records, you know, doesn't bring a shitload of revenue to the place. Actually, it does, Marion, I corrected. It's true that Tanya still fixes, upgrades, and sells computers and old records. But on my recommendation, she's also taken a few contracts in town where she works as a network administrator and analyst for a number of companies. All of her clients rave about her work. She practically outshines all the other IT people in Red River Falls. I swear to God, Pat, if I find out you're covering up any illegal activity for her, I'll... You'll do what? I interrupted. Don't forget I know what kind of crap you have on your home computer, Marion, I reprimanded. Marion froze in place. After a few tense moments, he said, You didn't come here to talk about Hayes and his whore. What do you want, Pat? Like I said, my wife is in jail for assaulting Hayes. I want you not to press any charges until I tell you that. That's my prerogative, Pat. I'm the one who decides, not you. No, you don't. Need I remind you of your nasty little hobby? Damn it, Pat, Lawson moaned. You know, I'm the goddamn county prosecutor. At some point, you're going to have to drop that shit and let me do my job. I realize that. But not right now. Just refrain from pressing charges until I tell you. If anyone asks you about it, which they shouldn't, just tell them the investigation is ongoing, and you'll make a statement to the public when it's complete. How the hell are you going to make sure people don't find out about her? She was booked into the Choctaw County Jail under an alias. Garrett Myers is a friend of hers. He's keeping an eye on her. Myers? The sheriff of Choctaw County? Didn't that damn old fossil run over a dead body a few months ago? Uh, yeah, yeah, ran over it, I replied embarrassed. However, in his defense, it was an accident on the far west side of his county during a really shitty snowstorm, and the body was almost completely hidden by the snowdrift. The state patrol had to mark where the body was. Yeah, I bet that was very comforting to the family. I'm sure the poor undertaker who had to take care of the body appreciated it too. Tell me again, how far did he get the body under his Tahoe before he realized what the hell was going on? Hmm, somewhere between 20 and 25 feet. Look, we're going sideways. Are you going to play ball with me or not? Okay, okay, Lawson said waving me off and rubbing his face. I won't press any charges. What's more, I'll pretend I don't know a damn thing about it until late Monday night or until you decide you want to press charges. I suppose you're plotting all this to cheat Clarissa out of a divorce? No. Well, not exactly. Okay, probably a little. 
but only to get her to agree to the divorce itself. The terms I'm offering, not that it's any of your business, but the terms I'm offering are pretty damn good. I don't want to screw her over. She's still the mom of my kids. Pat, Lawson said. He paused for a few moments. Can I ask you something personal? Gee, Marion, are we going to have a bonding session? Hardly, he hummed. Bummer. Oh, well. Shoot, I said. What happens to Clarissa when it's over? My eyes narrowed and my stomach clenched. What do you mean? Well, he began, I mean that Clarissa will obviously be single again. And I'm... sort of... maybe... wanted to see if you'd mind. Don't even think about it, I growled. What's the problem, Pat? You're obviously not going to be with her. You can see my marriage is in the toilet. I promise I'll treat your boys. I stood up, slammed both hands on Lawson's desk, looked him straight in the eye and growled, My boys already have a father. And my goddamn future ex-wife is out of reach for you, Marion. Do you understand? Do you understand? Lawson only sighed, raised his hands in surrender and said, All right, have it your way. But if I help you with this, I'll consider us even, Pat. I want you to get those damn photos off the file on my server, and I want those damn hidden photos off the internet. Deal? Let me explain something, Marion. You and Bud Roberts entertained my wife for a threesome. You had the nerve to even tell me about it and try to humiliate me about it. Guess what? You and I are not even. Not by how many... Damn. Shots. We won't be even for a long, long time, if ever. I stood up, walked over to the door to Marion's office, and unlocked it. Turning the knob, I looked at Marion one last time and said, And those goddamn pictures will stay where they are. Next chapter. I spent the night at the farm alone, not with Shannon, though I really wanted to stay with her. Who the hell wouldn't want to spend the night making love to this incredible woman and her amazing body? But I decided to spend it alone and finalize a few more details in my upcoming divorce plans. The next morning I skipped Sunday Mass, and by 9 o'clock I was in my department-issued and aging 2010 Ford Expedition. I pulled onto Highway 120 and headed south toward Cherokee Flats. The drive took about two hours and was fairly sparsely populated. The speed limit on the road was 65 miles per hour, so I was traveling fast and steady. The Choctaw County Jail was located in the northern part of Cherokee Flats. It was a newer building that housed the jail, sheriff's offices, and even a courtroom that served as an auxiliary to the room in the county courthouse. The jail itself was quite impressive and much larger than the one in Mason County, which was located on top of the Mason County Courthouse. There was a rather large exercise yard enclosed in three separate rings of chain-link fencing, each ring surrounded by three rows of razor-sharp wire. Woe betide anyone who was foolish enough to try to climb over it, let alone those who were brave enough to do so at least three times. The Choctaw County Jail differed from the Mason County Jail in another significant way, the visiting room. Both jails only allowed visitors for low-risk inmates. But while the Mason County Jail allowed visitors to see the inmate face-to-face, -face, the Choctaw County Jail used a video system that allowed visitors to see the inmates only on a closed-circuit television screen. The visitor's room was located completely across the street from the jail itself, and visitors and inmates were never closer than 300 feet apart. However, if you're an active sheriff whose wife is incarcerated, and if you're friends with the sheriff whose jail you're visiting, an exception can be made. Hey, Pat. Sheriff Garrett Myers greeted me in his office. He has been the sheriff of Choctaw County for almost 20 years. Garrett is about 60 years old, has a full head of perfectly styled silver hair, but is still in great shape for his age. How's the first week on the job going? It's going pretty well, Garrett. At least it was until Friday. I'm sure it is. I want you to know that we've been keeping a close eye on her the whole time she's been here. No one knows she's here. No one has looked for her or asked about her. She's only made one phone call, and I believe it was to her mother. Yes, I heard from her mother. She knows. 
If you follow me, Pat, we'll go right here. Although normal meetings are only by video link, we have to allow attorneys to meet with their clients in private. That's why we have a secure room in this hallway where you will meet your wife. Thank you, Garrett. I really appreciate it. Glad to have helped, Pat. And of course, stay here as long as you need to. Thanks again, Sheriff. I was let into a small 8x8 eight eight room with a small metal table and two metal stools that were securely fastened to the floor, ostensibly to keep the inmates from throwing them at their lawyers. There was no audio or video communication in the room to preserve attorney-client confidentiality. I also secured my personal firearm before entering the jail, and it was also checked and electronically searched. I was there for about five minutes before the door opened. I stood up as Clarissa was led into the room, wearing shackles that included handcuffs, ankle cuffs, and a chain that went around her waist and attached her arms to her body and connected to the ankle cuffs. This was done to make it difficult for inmates to attack correctional officers and also to make escape virtually impossible. A tall, athletically built African-American correctional officer led Clarissa to a stool and the edge of the table opposite to where I was sitting. As soon as she sat down, her ankle cuffs were fastened to a hook on the floor, and her handcuffs were fastened to a hook on the side of the table, further restricting her movements. Clarissa looked just awful, and that was putting it mildly. Her eyes were puffy and bloodshot, and it was obvious that she had been crying nonstop since she got here. Her hair was tangled and mussed, and she was clearly in need of a shower. She didn't look at me, struggling to hold back her tears. How are you, Clarissa? It was a stupid question, but the only one I could think of. How do you think? She answered in a barely audible whisper. I understand how you feel. No, you don't, she said, unable to hold back her tears any longer. How can you understand? Asterisk. How could you do this to me, Patrick? I leaned over and said, I didn't do this to you, Clarissa. You're here because you attacked one of my deputies. I'm sorry, she said, wailing and sobbing. I only got upset because I thought he came to tell me something bad had happened to you. That's not true, Clarissa, and you know it. You know full well what the procedures are for an officer's fall. Hell, you've been through this before, remember? You knew damn well Chris Hayes wasn't there. I swear to God, Patrick, that's exactly what I thought. I don't care what your assistant told you, she sobbed, still unable to look directly at me. No, Clarissa, you didn't. I have it all on video. How could you see anything? His car was parked in the driveway, Patrick. It's my word against his. Clarissa, a few months ago, we bought the little cameras that sheriff's deputies wear on their uniforms, like walkie-talkies. The cameras saw and recorded everything that happened. Chris Hayes approached you, handed you the ID, and then you followed him to his car. You deliberately followed him and were acting belligerent and provoking him the entire time. He put his hand out to prevent you from approaching him, at which point you proceeded to use your left hand and hit Chris on the right side of his face. I have it all on my phone. See? See? I pulled out my smartphone that Garrett had let me take with me. I opened the video clip and started playing it. Clarissa refused to look at my phone at first believing until the last second that there was no way this whole situation could have been caught on camera. But as soon as she heard the unmistakable and perfectly clear sound of her own voice, she immediately stopped crying and stared at the video, too shocked to say anything. When the video finished playing, Clarissa turned away from me again, only this time with shame. Patrick, what's going to happen to me? Well, I said, tucking my phone back into my pocket, it's up to you. Right now you're facing an assault charge, or rather, assaulting a police officer. That would be an aggravated misdemeanor. Theoretically, you could face two to five years in prison. Oh my God, she whispered. Please tell me you'll help me, Patrick. I will help you, Clarissa. But you will also help me. What do you want me to do? I want you to sign the divorce papers. I want you to take them, sign them, and make this whole process as smooth and painless as possible for us, for Nick and Jake. Is that what this is about? You arrested me to get what you wanted in the divorce? 
You son of a bitch. She burst into tears again and sobbed, trying to pull herself together and control her breathing. No, Clarissa. Make no mistake about it. That's not what got you imprisoned. You could have easily taken the papers and lost your cool when we spoke again. Instead, you decided to dive off the crazy board and went straight to jail. The attack on my assistant brought you here, not me. If you're right about anything, make sure you get that part right. Then how is helping me get a divorce going to help me? I'll help you get the charges reduced so you get off with only time served. Or, if I'm very lucky, I can get Deputy Sheriff Hayes to drop the case altogether. But I'll only speak on your behalf if you agree to make our divorce as painless as possible. Will you agree to that, Clarissa? She raised her eyes to the ceiling in despair. What choice do I have? Easy. You can either help yourself, or you can't. But I don't want a divorce, Patrick. How many times do I have to say it? I don't want a divorce. I don't want to splinter our family. I want our family to stay together. Clarissa, do you remember what we talked about before we got married? Do you remember what we said would happen if one of us cheated on the other? Tears streamed down her face again as she closed her eyes, remembering our conversation from long ago. We always said that cheating in our marriage was a deal breaker. You wouldn't put up with it from me, and I wasn't going to put up with it from you. We always said we could handle any situation except infidelity. But I was wrong, Patrick. I think we can get through this if we just work on it. I know I want to work on it. I want to find a way for us to love each other again like we did when we first fell in love. I want us to feel special again. I want to feel like you love me and make love to me like you used to, Patrick. You know what, Clarissa? You know what I hear? I hear you say the word me a lot. In other words, it's all about you. This whole sad affair has been about you. It's all about you and what you want. You know what I haven't heard you say yet? I haven't heard you say yet. I'm sorry, Patrick. I'm sorry for the hell I've put you through these past two years. I'm sorry for the pain, heartache, and humiliation I put you through. I've never heard that from you, Clarissa. And if you say it now, it won't mean anything. Because you're only saying it because you want to get out of here and get out of a difficult situation. There's no easy solution here. There's no easy way out. But I'm really sorry, Patrick. I'm sorry I haven't said it until now. But I know we're both stronger than we realize. I've seen a whole new side of you, Patrick. I admit I took you for granted, but now I see how tough as nails you are. I've seen how hard you fought back. And I know you can fight just as hard for our marriage if you really want to, she pleaded. But I don't want to, Clarissa. I don't want to fight this battle anymore. I just want it to be over. You have no idea what you've done to me. All I see when I look at you is something that once belonged to me, but was taken from me. If we ever tried to make love, all I'd do is think about Bud Roberts or any other guy you were with and torture myself with thoughts of you wanting to be with him instead of me. I always wondered if I was strong enough or a good enough lover to satisfy you. I even wondered if you thought I was a good enough father for our boys. I can't go through this for the rest of my life, Clarissa. I just can't. Clarissa sat up and sobbed softly. I hoped it was because the realization of what she had done to me, our marriage, and our family had finally come. But I was also under no illusions that it could have been tears of remorse for the missed opportunities she'd had. Please try, Patrick. I'm begging you. I can't, Clarissa, I said, tears welling up in my eyes and a lump building up in my throat. There's too much to overcome. I could never, ever get over what you and Bud Roberts did. I know myself well enough to know what I can and can't handle. You almost cost me my family and my freedom, Clarissa. There's no taking that back. Just sign the papers. Sign the papers and I'll do everything in my power to help you get out of this mess, or at least make it less shitty than it is. If you really loved me or cared about me, please do one thing for me. At the very least, you owe it to me. Clarissa wrapped her arms around her head and sobbed for almost five minutes straight. Eventually, she struggled to regain a modicum of composure, wiped away her tears as best she could, and then accepted a pen from me with her hands bound, signed the divorce papers, and agreed to all my terms. 
I would pay Clarissa a half share of the farm and split all our savings in half. I would continue to insure her until she found a suitable job that would provide her own insurance or for one year, whichever came first. I would help Clarissa find suitable housing that could serve as a second home for the boys, as the farm would remain their primary home. I would also pay her annual rent to help her get back on her feet, and I would continue to make payments on her Explorer until it was paid off. I will also pay for her cell phone for at least one year. My attorney, Daniel Nichols, thought I was crazy to agree to such terms. In fact, maybe I was. Heck, Clarissa's mother, Caroline, was now deeply involved with a man named Martin Belmond, who was a multimillionaire a dozen times over. I had no doubt that Clarissa's mother would do whatever was necessary to help her daughter. I was doing all this because I wanted to be sure that Clarissa was treated fairly so that she couldn't accuse me of trying to screw her over. If I had used her being in jail as leverage, someone might have gotten the impression that I had acted like an asshole. But if things had turned out differently, and Clarissa and Bud Roberts had gotten their way, things would have been much worse for me, which I can't even imagine. Stuff happens to cops when they go to jail. However, I did have one little surprise for Clarissa. I got the magistrate, Judge Hannah Bergen, to order Clarissa's release on her own recognizance. This was very unusual especially since I had to call the judge and stop by to get the papers signed. Even though Clarissa was being held in the Choctaw County Jail, the case was filed in Mason County, so we were still under jurisdiction. I'm sure there will be those among the public who will raise seven different shades of holy hell about this, but I didn't care. The upside was that it would make Clarissa happy. The minus, however, was that I would now be forced to make the two-hour trip home with Clarissa. It took Sheriff Meyer's officers about 45 minutes to get Clarissa out of the Choctaw County Jail. Part of that time was spent giving Clarissa a chance to shower before being released. Even more time was spent signing paperwork and returning the few personal items she had. I grabbed a complete change of clothes for her, and by 1 p.m. we left Cherokee Flats and headed home. We drove in complete silence for almost an hour before either of us said anything. Finally. I couldn't stand it. Are you hungry? I asked. Hey! Clarissa just stared out the passenger window and shook her head. Do you want to stop and get something to drink? I don't want to divorce, Patrick. I know I signed the papers, but I didn't mean to. I kept both hands on the steering wheel at ten and two and clutched it in desperation. I sucked air in deeply through my nose and exhaled slowly. Clarissa, we've talked about this before. As far as I'm concerned, it's a done deal. She wasn't crying anymore, but tears were streaming down her face again. Well, if this is your way of torturing me, Patrick, it's working. I couldn't take it anymore. I slammed on the brakes hard without locking them, pulled over to the side of the road, and slid the lever into park. Torturing you, Clarissa? What about me, huh? How about torturing me? Is that what you think, Patrick? That living with me will be like torture? Torture? Jesus, woman, you're just stupid. I'm not talking about spending the rest of my life with you. I'm talking about all the shit that could have happened to me if your little venture with Bud Roberts had succeeded. But it didn't, Patrick, okay? The whole thing failed because of that. Maybe it happened for a reason. Maybe we were supposed to stay together. At least you have to learn to move on. I can't, damn it. For God's sake, Patrick, why the hell not? Why can't we at least try to move on with our lives together? Why is divorce the only option? I turned away from her. She was so oblivious to her deviousness and utter insanity that she was now physically and emotionally pushing me away. I sat like that for a few moments, seeing in my peripheral vision her looking at me pleadingly. I did my best to look away. It took everything I could not to break down to find a way to keep my cool and fight the urge to smash Clarissa's head into the dashboard again and again and again and again until there was nothing left of her but her neck and a bloody stump in place of her blunt, fat melon. And then I thought of Shannon, and a familiar, serene wave of calm spilled over my body, and I found my center and true purpose in life again. I closed my eyes and thought of her and imagined the feel of her body 
the feminine power of her embrace, the taste of her lips, and the smell of her soaps, lotions, and perfumes. It was then that I calmed down enough to say to Clarissa what I had been trying to find the strength to say to her all along. I can't, Clarissa. I have no way to move on with my life. To do that, Clarissa, I'm going to have to go back to being the old me, the one who trusted you and loved you enough to have no doubt that you would ever cheat on me, the one who never wondered if you loved me back. What you did to me, Clarissa, absolutely changed me on a molecular level, if that's even possible. Your betrayal and the plans you shared with Bud Roberts to completely crush and destroy me have turned me into someone I never thought I could become. And it's both amazing and tragic at the same time. To save myself, I had to learn to think as evil as you and Bud. To save myself, I had to learn to plot, conspire, beg, borrow, and steal to get what I needed to stay out of jail. I broke the laws I swore to uphold just to serve what I thought was a greater purpose. I tore the threads of the law to keep the veil of justice intact and to keep the unsuspecting public safe from dangerous people who might otherwise be free to roam the streets and countryside because of what you and Bud Roberts tried to do to me. I have become what I despise, conniving, manipulative, conniving, mean-spirited, and other adjectives and superlative words you can think of to describe me. But I never did any of those things for myself. I did them for my boys. I did them for the community at large. I've done them for you, and even for Bud Roberts and Marion Lawson. I don't have blood on my hands, Clarissa, but I got a hell of a lot of dirt on them now. I'm not the Dudley Dorite I used to be. But the silver lining, Clarissa, is that thanks to your and Bud's actions, I survived. I can honestly say there is nothing I wouldn't do to protect my family, friends, and the people of Mason County from harm. I have faced death because of my commitment to this cause, and I have come back to tell it, both literally and figuratively. I put it in reverse gear, honked, put the big SUV on the highway, and headed back toward Red River Falls. So, yes, Clarissa, you're right. I'm tough as nails. Fighting for your life, whether it's from death itself or from an existence worse than death in prison, will do that to you. So I won't thank you for ruining our family. But in a way, I am thanking you for making me a stronger person. Because I can honestly say that I would never have been ready to be sheriff if it wasn't for you. At this point, I stopped talking and the rest of the trip my soon-to-be ex-wife and I drove in silence. It was literally a journey into the future for Clarissa, for now she had to decide what her future would be. Only she could set the direction. The only thing I knew was that her future would not include me, at least not as her husband. When we got home, Clarissa, without saying a word, went upstairs and got into bed. She slept for several hours, probably from pure exhaustion after the weekend spent in jail. The boys had returned home from a weekend trip with a youth group to the Twin Cities and were eager to tell us all about it. As I listened to their youthful chatter and excitement, I realized there was no way I would have arrested Clarissa if they had been home all weekend instead of 200 miles east of here. Luck for me, and bad luck for Clarissa. Eventually, Clarissa came downstairs around dinner time. She smiled and greeted the boys with hugs and kisses on their heads. She had prepared a light dinner for all of us, consisting of fried ham and cheese sandwiches. And to my amazement, after dinner, Clarissa asked us all to stay at the dinner table. I had no idea what was in store for me, but she sat down at the table and broke the news to the boys that she and I were breaking up. She explained to the boys that we were having some serious problems and that although we loved both Nick and Jake very much, she and I couldn't stay together and she was going to move out for a while. Clarissa even said that it was her decision and asked Nick and Jake not to be angry with me as it wasn't my fault. She was a little sneaky, though, saying that she wasn't sure how long we'd have to be apart, just long enough for her and me to work out some differences. I'm sure she didn't take too long to give the boys time to adjust to the fact that we weren't together, and I was grateful to her for that. She also assured the boys that their home would not change, and they would stay in the house and on the small piece of land with their horses, cattle, dogs, and cats that they had grown to love so much. Clarissa assured them that although the boys would not be spending time with her and me at the same time, they would still see both of us all the time. 
She even asked them to help me whenever possible, and also asked them to help her find a suitable place to live in Red River Falls so they could spend time there after school and then return home to the farm each evening. To their credit, the boys were saddened, but took the news much better than I expected. Of course, it was not without tears, but none of them broke down completely or became hysterical. Perhaps they had suspected and even expected that this was what would eventually happen. Nick alluded to this back when I was at a law enforcement conference in Minneapolis a year and a half ago. Sometimes, we adults don't give our children credit for their intuition and perception of the world around them. A few days later, Clarissa rented a very nice apartment in a new townhouse complex inside a gated community. The complex had its own playground and pool, which the boys were sure to enjoy this summer, and it was six blocks from the high school they both attended. It didn't take long for Chris Hayes to talk Clarissa into dropping the charges against her for assaulting a police officer. I think Chris knew how hard this would be for all of us and realized that Clarissa was acting out of desperate self-preservation and not out of malice toward him or any other sheriff's deputy. Marion Lawson played ball, as I demanded, and Judge Hannah Bergen did her best to keep the matter quiet. If we ever had an audit for any reason, people remembered that something happened, but there was no paperwork or reports to clarify what. Of course, I never told Clarissa anything about it, just to make sure the divorce went through. When I told Shannon all of this, she was incredibly supportive because she knew that the finality of the impending divorce was weighing on me. Not because I wanted to stay married to Clarissa, but simply out of grief and remorse over a dead and failed marriage. It was strange, because now I could focus on my new life with Shannon and Bridget, which was to rise from the ashes of my former life with Clarissa. And deep down, I knew that my boys would fit in well with Shannon and Bridget and accept them as stepmother and stepsister. I was sure there would be conflicts and stumbles along the way, but my intuition told me that there would be many more beautiful days in our future than rocky ones. And eventually, I even began to hope that one day, the right man would come into Clarissa's life and give her the happiness that I couldn't. Another big surprise was my future father-in-law's revelation that his upcoming wedding gift to Shannon and me would be to pay off the mortgage on a piece of land so that Shannon and I could focus on other things besides working to pay the bank. It was more than I could have imagined, more than I deserved, and I was so overwhelmed by his offer that I refused at first. But Jack Sullivan reminded me that I didn't want to get on his bad side and that there was nothing he wouldn't do for his daughter and granddaughter. Then he laughed hysterically, enclosed me in a tight bear hug and said, Welcome to the family. Thus, one important chapter in my life came to an end, and the next chapter is ready to be written. All the main characters are in place. There is no need to dwell on the past, only a bright future ahead. From this day forward, the only story that will matter is the story we create ourselves. The end. Thanks for watching, I hope you enjoyed it, so subscribe to my channel and watch the next video.